What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Smoke and Tire Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Blue Driver. So your check engine light comes on. What do you do? Step one, get yourself a Blue Driver Pro Scan Tool. Blue Driver can read all the computer systems in your vehicle, tell you what the problem is, and suggest solutions from a database of millions of ASC verified fixes. Then, fix the problem yourself, or head to the garage armed with knowledge. Either way, you're in control. Plus, Blue Driver can do so much more than just read codes. View live data from your vehicle, read freeze frame and mode six, do a small Smog check, stay up to date on recalls and service bulletins, and much more. That's why Blue Driver is the best selling scan tool on Amazon. Don't just take our word for it, check out the thousands of positive reviews on Amazon. Reviews written by real people who saved a ton of time and money by using Blue Driver. For a limited time, take advantage of our special smoking tire offer. Visit bluedriver.com slash TST. That's bluedriver.com slash TST to get 10% off the Blue Driver Pro Scan Tool. Don't let your car troubles be a mystery again. Get Blue Driver today. BlueDriver.com slash TST. Oh, the Brio Beardscape. My, how I love the Brio Beardscape. The Beardscape is a portable battery-powered buzzer. It's got a powerhouse of a motor. It's got a a ceramic blade instead of a stainless steel blade, so it stays sharper longer, you don't have to oil it as often, and it really helps cut through those thick Arab hairs I have. Plus, the battery lasts a real long time, there's a power level indicator on the uh, the Beardscape so you know exactly how much shave time you've got left, and it's easy to clean up, comes with a variety of attachments. I love the Beardscape because I used to have the crappy kind of cheap ones you'd buy at the drugstore, you know, like you get them at like a Target or whatever. I kept breaking those. Uh, they just, they couldn't, they couldn't deal with my duty cycles. So I got one of those super beast, like steel professional grade barber joints. It was like $300. You had to plug it in and it's like made entirely of metal. Not exactly practical when you're on the road. The Beardscape has the horsepower of the beastie one, but it's the portability of the cheap stuff and the durability. I've been using the same one for two years. It's solid. Go to brio4life.com. That's brio, the number four life.com and use code smoking at checkout. Brio4life.com, code smoking at checkout and get yourself the Beardscape for the best price on the internet. Last but not least, of course, it's Nextspace, the world's leading dash cam brand. These dash cams are now available in the US. You've seen the Russian dash cam videos. You know what kind of crazy stuff happens in cars. Be a part of the solution, not the problem. Get that evidence, son. But Next Space is more than just a dash cam. The Series 2 range includes exciting features, 1440p, the IPS touchscreen, a parking mode, which is sort of like a motion detector for, uh, for your car while it's parked. Rear-facing and add-on modules allow you to view the inside of your vehicle or the road behind you, perfect for parents or rideshare drivers, and those wary of tailgaters. Get peace of mind while you drive with NextSpace, available at Best Buy nationwide in the U.S. and Canada, or online at Amazon.com. Listeners of the Smoking Tire get 15% off of NextSpace cams on Amazon. Use code 15 Oops, sorry, that's the old code. Use code 20 smoking. That's the number 20 smoking. 20 smoking gets you 20% off, not 15% off, 20% off next space dash cams on Amazon. All right, on this show, uh, we've got Russell Carr, who is the head of design for Lotus, and he has been for over uh, 15 years. He worked on the Esprit, the Elise, the Evora, and the new Evaya electric hypercar. Uh, we have a great chat. I, I like this dude very much. It was really interesting to have him on the show. I love the Lotus Evoras that I've been dri- driving recently, so we chat a lot about that, uh, as well as you know how one gets that amazing job being head of design for Lotus Russell Carr on the smoking tire podcast well uh are you good I'm good are you a little stressed in traffic 
A little bit, yeah, a little bit, but, uh, you know. <laughs> well, welcome all, to the show. It's all part of the excitement, isn't it? Russell Carr is head of design. Head of design, design director, whatever design you want to call Design director. Yeah, whatever you want to call it. Make yeah. it up every year, you yeah, just change exactly, it around. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You can use, well, since you guys handwrite the business cards at Lotus, you know, whatever, <laughs> right? Get that mic a little closer to your okay, mouth. You kind of got to eat these mics. The, the good side oh, okay. is, though, like... Is that better? It's perfect. All the garbage that happens outside the room doesn't make it into the mic. That's the good news. <laughs> so you just woke up in Pebble Beach this morning, went to Magnus's, and then came here? That's right, yeah. <laughs> just jumped in uh, an Avora and drove down, Avora GT, so that's pretty cool. The green one. Yeah, the green one. I yeah. think that's the same one I drove. Oh, okay. Is, it the LA, yeah. is that the LA car? Um, Rob's nodding so, his head yeah. in the background. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, it's and it was a clean lovely. and everything. You left it clean and everything. It's, so that's well, good. So people have driven it since May, right. oh, okay. but it is a lovely car. Yeah. That's a quality automobile. I am like, and Rob will tell you that I'm like a an evangelist for the supercharged Avoras. Hmm. They are such good cars. Yeah, a lot of fun to drive, aren't they? Very comfortable as well. So, and they ask, yeah, they ask nothing of you. Yeah, they're very easy. And uh, <clears throat> nice reaction from other people as well, which is good. I got one. Rob hooked me up for, I think it was about three weeks, and I did like 2,500 miles and five track days in the car. Mm -hmm. And it asked absolutely nothing of me in return. It was the only one I saw the entire time I had it. Mm -hmm. I did a full lap of California racetracks, and everybody was surprised at the lap times which mm. were very very strong yeah um so welcome to the show thanks for making the time you're welcome um, i uh, i hope you're not too exhausted <laughs> no my body's relaxed the car yeah. was good but a little bit stressed following rob through the traffic so oh. that was the only thing yeah well you had to be very aggressive here <laughs> there's a whole other set of it's rules it's not like being in norfolk and england no i love driving <laughs> in the uk i really do roundabouts are so civilized you know because yeah. it's really about keeping moving yeah. you know it's the stop and go that drives yeah. you nuts yeah that's why i appreciate the light clutch in the avora though yeah it's a, it's very easy to drive in in traffic yeah. it doesn't get mad yeah um so Larry, let's 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 you have an awesome job you have what probably everyone listening to shows going that is a i design cars that but only sports cars exactly what it's a not great, a bad day job is it no what a gig where mm. did you come from so, uh, like a lot of people, went to design college, and there's a famous design college in Coventry in England. Oh, and so that's where which one is that? That's Coventry. Oh, it's called Coventry. Uh, oh, Coventry yeah. Design College, and uh, that's the equivalent of like our arts center or yeah, one of those kind of places. It's not quite such glamorous setting, but mm. uh, a lot of talented people there. Um, so yeah, a lot of people I know, you know, went on to work at other other top studios, etc. So that's where I started, mm -hmm. and then I went to work for a company called MGA, which was a consultancy and uh, got to know some people at Lotus and then got a call and it was a funny call from my uh, first boss. He said, look, do you know of any good designers who we can uh, uh, hire here? Maybe a couple of years of experience. So I was very diligent. I uh, thought hard. I picked up some names and phoned him back. Did you want to immediately go, um, me, hello? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't that smart, though. Last <laughs> last moment I went, uh, yeah, what, what about me? Yeah. And, and there was some deal that he couldn't overtly offer me a job. So, uh, And yes. when, about, so was, about when was that? So that was 1990. So, okay. so I worked on, and uh, so that guy was called Julian Thompson. He's now design director at uh, Jaguar. That name's familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. F-Type, right? And yeah. F-Pace. Yeah, that's right. Or yeah. is that, is he Ian's boss or is no, Ian's just retired so Julian's just taken oh he over. took over yeah, for him exactly. okay gotcha, so, gotcha, gotcha so yeah, uh, yeah so uh, I worked for him for a, a few years and then I then I took over at the end of the uh, the 90s so uh, yeah very exciting very exciting job because like a lot of people I grew up with with Lotus being yeah the racing team, the sports car, the James Bond car. Yeah. All those things. The car from If Looks Could Kill yeah. with Richard Grieco. <laughs> you, you that, Do you that, remember that one? That one I don't know. Come uh, on. You don't know I'll, the, I'll be the that finest one. performance. It's it's basically uh, an Esprit SE mm. that is sort of a Bond car for a unwitting Bond type character. Okay, I'll look that it's one up. It's a very silly 80s movie. I'll look that one yeah. up. Yeah. No. The trick was that the, the spoiler popped up to become like a bulletproof shield. That was the trick move maybe, for Maybe it. we'll do that on a future car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Maybe we'll do that, yeah. Totally. So you then, your first project would have been the redesign of the Esprit? 
So, right. when, well, when I first joined, we worked on redesigns of Esprit. So I worked on what was called the S4 Esprit and the Sport 300 mm -hmm. and the S4S. And uh, I was part of the design team that worked on the first Elise. And then when Julian left, we did the second generation Elise. So that was the first sort of my whole project basically within uh the uh, the Esprit just you want you made me want to pull up this picture mm -hmm. has really aged well. Yeah, it's a cool car. They right? are such a treat, especially in Southern California where they're not particularly popular mm -hmm. um, compared to 911s and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. They're such a treat to see at a car show because yeah. they're so neat. Yeah, and no, a fantastic car to drive as well. Yeah, great looking car. Yeah, and it's uh, it's really aged well, isn't it? But, yeah. So when you so. When you came in, there was an Esprit, obviously, mm -hmm. since the late 70s, mm -hmm. right? So there was an S1 and there was an S2, and then yeah. there was the Turbo. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. you were after that, right? Yeah, and then they did what we refer to internally as the X180, which is where they made the car a little bit softer looking. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the rounded more, off. Yeah, uh, which was Peter Stevens who did that car. Um, and that's the car that was in Pretty Woman. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, so when I joined Lotus, that, that was, was good a, for business, that huh? That was a big deal. Was yeah. that good? Was that super good for business? That was a really good year for sales. Um, it's a huge movie. Yeah, huge movie. Um, and I remember that, like, as because I was a kid, I really remember that as being, like, part of my childhood. Now you're making me feel bad now saying you were a kid there. I know. I was already working I'm 30, Lotus, so. I know, I'm 37. <laughs> I, I I really appear far older than I am. I've had a rough had a rough thirty seven. We, we share the same barber. I just had uh, Scott Pruitt, the racing yeah, driver, yeah. in here, and he's like a thousand years old, and he looks like he just graduated from college. Like, yeah, that makes you sick, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, so when you have a car that's and you're you're tasked with updating it, yeah. right? So how do you approach that task? Is it from a performance standpoint, or you just go, you know, maybe some scoops and some skirts will do this? Or yeah, there are all kinds of things. There's always technical up upgrades that the engineers want to do on the car, um, and then from a design point of view, um, you know, by nature we always think we can do it better than the person who did it before, and right. we have ideas. And of course, you're right. Yeah, you know, there, there's sometimes some technical requirements that we need to accommodate. So. Towards the latter end of the life of the the Esprit, for example, when we put the V8 engine in it, yeah, we had a lot more cooling to get into the car, so we had to to open up the intakes right, right, on, right. on the face. Um, Let me get a little V8 image there. Um, we played a lot with the, the V8s were fun. Those were those things were pretty. They sounded pretty cool. They sounded they? real cool. A friend of mine had a real ag a real aggressive one. Yeah. The uh, that, it was very pretty too, wasn't it? Well, thank you. It was. It was that's, a, that's a fantastic looking car. Just a classic yeah. wedge shape. But yeah. then, you know, as it as it got as it aged, yeah. the wheels got a little bigger, the wings got so, a little bigger, and cool. yeah, yeah, and the wings and the the spoiler and things. Obviously, that was all to do with the performance. Uh, you know, uh, getting more downforce on the car and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, and looking always to to kind of clean it up each time we do it. You know. Yeah. But, but as I say, it's the nature of every design. They think you know their idea is better than the predecessor. Uh, oh, of so, course. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know who was wrong about that? Pagani <laughs> and the Countach. He was really wrong there back in 88. Um, <laughs> that conversation every weekend at Cars and Coffee. Uh, Elise. So you were there for from the beginning of the Elise S1 to what we now have, yeah. which is the third gen Elise, right? Yeah. So now we're talking about a clean slate car. This would have been, was this your first clean slate car? Or was there a lawn as well? Uh, no, that was done by the time I got there. Okay. So uh, the Elise, I worked on the first generation one, but it was that was very much Julian's car. Okay. But I, I was there as part of the design team, so we did scale models and things. So in the, you know, Lotus is a pretty small company mm. compared to most car companies. Mm. So how far is your studio from the chassis guy's studio, and how often are you guys fighting about things like? Not necessarily the chassis. Actually, the chassis guys we usually get on pretty well with yeah. because they're they're really passionate car guys as well. So, uh, but uh, ev everyone's really close. It's a small site. It's built around uh, what was uh, an old airfield from the, the Second World War, so you can get a sense of what the scale is. And uh, yeah, there's about 1,200 people there. Uh, they make the cars, and design and engineer them. So we're all pretty close. So, uh, but you're right. It's it's good being close. So when you have disagreements yeah challenges um it, they can happen very quickly and um you know everyone pretty well generally mm -hmm. um at the moment uh, perhaps a little less so because good news is we're expanding you know greatly so 
Uh, yeah, you guys, got to, you guys got some ha- money now, huh? There's hundreds of engineers <laughs> joining us, but uh, generally, you know, we know one another pretty well. And if we don't like something, we can uh, pick up a phone or walk upstairs or wherever it is. Yeah. Whereas if you're at a bigger company, you might find out the person you want to have an argument with is in another country in another time zone. Yeah. So, uh, I feel like if you spend your career working in a company like that, it would be a real struggle like it would be so corporate and depressing to go work for even a mildly larger you know like even you know like mclaren or something Mm -hmm. which is still pretty Mm -hmm. boutique it must it would be like the most corporate thing ever yeah i think i think probably mclaren culture from what i know is quite similar to us but yeah definitely it's great being small you can make things happen quickly uh the downside i think probably our families would say is we we end up working too hard because we we're really drawn into the projects we get really passionate about it and we put a lot of hours in, but uh, it makes the products very personal. We really, we really care about what we're doing. I feel like is is Lotus very like multi generational? I feel like there's got to be like people whose dads worked there, you know, with Colin, who are now doing stuff there, right? Yeah, it uh, certainly is. I've worked uh, the guy who's our stu- one of our studio engineers, the guy who's the lead studio engineer. His dad was one of the senior engineers when I joined, so yeah, yeah. Well, I've had a uh, close hand with that. And then we've got across the road, it's a separate company, we've got a company called Classic Team Lotus that look after all the old racing cars, the single seat ones. Oh, that's probably that's, a pretty cool gig. And that's run by a guy called Clive Chapman, so his dad, oh, his yeah, dad was, somebody. Quite, he was He was quite big in the early years. <laughs> yeah. uh, so... Um, yeah, I, and it goes through the company. Yeah, you, you, you're right. You get to multi generation. I think that's true of a lot of car companies, actually. You mm. know, particularly, you know, just regionally, it's a, it's a, it's a significant employer. You know, where I really saw it was Morgan. Yeah, Morgan's like, you know, it's like a clan basically. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a clan of like gypsies building. <laughs> yeah, there's like I saw like three generations uh, yeah. in like the fucking wooden body <laughs> shop they've got going on over there. Yeah, that place. And you go in there, you go. Let me just give you guys money for yeah. like something, anything, yeah. whatever. Um, so now you guys are. I'm gonna. I'm gonna like. I, we could talk about Avora too because I love Avora. It's so nice. So you did the styling of Avora. Yeah, I've worked on, on all of the, mm-hmm. the Avora. So we, we did the first one was launched 2009. And uh, it was designed really to be um, a more relaxed, easier to live with car than the Elise. Um, so for someone who wanted to use it as an, an everyday car, albeit I used to use my Elise as, a, as an everyday yeah, car. Yeah, you got to be years. hardcore to do that. <laughs> you, you need to be kind of like a martyr a little bit, really really committed yeah. to that cause yeah I, I drive an exige at the moment which isn't on sale <laughs> here but that's uh yeah that's not for everybody but i but i love it yeah yeah it's it's yeah you have to be the right size if you're yeah, the right yeah. size and the right you do the right amount of yoga <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. but the whole the whole concept yeah the avora was to be a little bit more everyday usable yeah space behind the front seats either for uh kids seats or putting your luggage luggage good, definitely luggage yeah. Uh, and, a, and a good load space at the back of the car. And over the years, we've given it more power. We've toughened it up. Very similar to what we did with the Esprit, really. Yeah. Um, so we just launched the latest iteration, which is the... Uh, which is GT. The GT. Uh, so it's quite nice. Yeah. Yeah, I, more I, power, lighter, more refined, and some really cool features on it as well, some aero features on it, which I think are quite tough. It's just... You know what I love about this car is it's... It's only got one suspension setting. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, and at no point during my thousands of miles driving these things mm-hmm. have I ever been like, I wish this had a different mm-hmm. mode. Like, you just don't yeah. need it. If you've got the right chassis rigidity yeah. and the right suspension geometry and the right wheels and tires, and you don't need any of that extra garbage. It's it's all like, it just works. That's so that's, great. That's, that's the that's the philosophy, and we're really fortunate. We've got a guy called uh, Gavin Kershaw, who's one of our senior development engineers. So not only is he a brilliant road car development engineer, he's worked with all kinds of different companies with the consultancy business that uh, we've done over the years. And oh, our, that would be the handling by Lotus. Uh, that sort the of very thing, yeah. famous handling by that's Lotus. That badge. sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but he's also been twice British GT champion. Oh. So. If you think you know better than him and his team, uh, it's kind of quite surprising, really. So that's why there's one setting, really. So yeah. 
Well, that's it's a very famous uh, Colin Chapman quote, isn't it? Make it adjustable and they'll adjust it wrong. <laughs> I think that's a famous Colin Chapman quote. All the good quotes usually come from him, so that's probably. It true. might be fake. It was in it was in some automotive journalist email <laughs> signature. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know, but I remember very distinctly, and I I find that most um, at least front engine rear drive cars, most of them are too stiff, mm-hmm. and I think it's because. They want to sell them to people who drive them around mm-hmm. the block once and go, well, this feels sporty mm-hmm. and that's not actually very good. But Lotus makes cars that are not actually that stiff unless you get like an Exige S260 cup or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, the normal cars are really they're really nicely um, um, damped and sprung so they don't beat you up. Well, they use a lovely emotive term. They talk about the car breathing. Yeah, over, that's a good uh, term. Over the road. Yeah. Which In New is- Zealand, they say it, it's got to have it's got to have a lot of give. It's got have give my you know what i mean same kind of thing yeah. uneven pavement the british yeah. b roads you yeah. know what i mean you, it has to like actually mm. move um can we talk about this lunatic thing i yeah. assume i assume That's this on you, is baby i assume this you are quite proud of will you pronounce it for me Avaya. Avaya. yeah i thought it was a via okay i'm off you everyone's got to work on making yeah. their car names more pronounceable <laughs> global trademarks are annoying i get it right isn't that it yeah. Yeah, global trademarks are annoying, but yeah, if I, uh, we all had to practice a little bit, but uh, we're, we're there now. What's it one. mean? It's it's first of its kind, basically, and that's really important for us because this is our first EV car, our first uh, electric car. But and of course, did you not- did you simplify and add lightness? <laughs> I don't think so. Well, you know, it's very weight efficient, I think is what we'd say. So So give me the stats real quick. So in uh, European terms, it's 1,680 kilos, which is about 3,600 pounds. Which for an EV is light, actually. Yeah, Yeah. uh, and for EV sports cars, it's light. We've got equivalent of about 2,000 horsepower, which uh, I uh, I think we would say makes the car quite nippy. Uh, I always laugh when someone uh, says some shit like 2,000. It's like, cut 2,000 uh, horsepower? Yeah. Is there a need for 2,000 <laughs> horsepower? I mean, like, what human can handle such a thing? I think uh, I think it's like all sports cars. You know, you, know, you don't justify them on rational purpose reasons, no. do you? I'm it's just hoping about- we don't see them wrapped around telephone yeah. poles. Uh, there are, I don't know all the details, because I'm not the technical guy, but there's different modes you can put it in, and that gives you access to different power. I like the and valet I, mode, uh, is probably uh, like a thousand uh, horsepower. <laughs> yeah, it's, it starts off around about four, five hundred horsepower, so I think that's probably more than enough, definitely yeah. for me. Um, but uh, yeah, very exciting project. Uh, well, so on. tell me about the design, since this is your area of expertise. This, this sort of, uh, I don't, paperclip shape? Can I, is that it's, is that term does it a disservice? But when you look at it from a direct side profile, it's actually mildly paperclippy. But that's a beautiful shape of the air intake on the side. So tell oh, me about this whole thing. Well, you've used the phrase beautiful, and that's something we we used and sort of winced a bit early on because well, you'd expect us to make cars that are beautiful, but it's really easy when you do something as extreme as this to get a little bit carried away and perhaps do something which is a little bit overly shouty yes. or um, a bit crazy. Um, we, uh, <laughs> we, look, we look to our friends in Dubai. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I almost just spilled water all over the table. <laughs> okay. But, uh, so, so Beautiful was one, one of the things. And then we, you know, we obviously wanted this car to be uh, very contemporary. We wanted it to have unique features. Um, we want it to have the latest technology, which has got all over the place. And um, we wanted it to, to look like a Lotus. Now, there are certain shapes, forms, lines, which make things Lotus. But there's also... This black s- canopy is extremely Evora-esque, actually. That's very like, Evora, yeah. Like, if we go, look at that. Here's the Evora, and here's the Avaya. The shape is quite similar that's there lotus. That, that's some lotus there right there you go yeah. and you'll notice the kind of haunch lines you get on the car the way that the fender lines for front and rear go mm. quite muscular because i like to do the the ca- as though the cabin is sort of sunk between the wheels right and then the shoulders on the car look very sort of muscular that you really get from this angle exactly, here exactly yeah this rear end i think you know from the front it's it it's um a little more conventional supercar but from the back it gets real crazy well the big story <laughs> on the car is the aerodynamics um so aerodynamics are really important to lotus you know in the 50s 
we were right at the front with this is before my time yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> with those, just, just with those scaffold yeah. wings <laughs> <laughs> well they're the 60s but yeah 50s is all streamlining the wings came in the 60s ground effect in the 70s with the race car but aerodynamics is really important on a car like this obviously it's important reduce drag you improve the top speed you also improve the range of the car and of course we want to create downforce so to start off with I were, I was in conversation with our aerodynamics guy and we were talking about what they do on modern motorsport cars and how they manage the airflow mm. through the car as well as over the exterior surfaces. And I said, could we do something like that? And he said, well, yeah, that's really good. He st- and he started using words like transparency and porosity, which basically he just wants the minimum blockage of the air. Mm-hmm. Keep the air moving fast, reduces drag. But we just thought from a design studio point of view, it's a really neat theme in terms of sculpture. Uh, it's almost like the car's being carved by air, which is uh, is perhaps a bit pretentious. But once you get into that mindset, no, I get everything it. is being smoothed. Or a bit like, you know, you see a river or an ocean will carve away the rock surfaces around it. And that gives you something very beautiful. It gives you something which has got motion when you're looking at it. Your eyes yeah. drawn through the car. One of my favorite places is these swirled sandstone canyons in Utah, which are done from you know yeah. millions of years of water and yeah. wind flowing through yeah. these places. And like Lower Antelope yeah. Canyon is a beautiful place like that. Same as I think I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. Can I ask you a question that other people will be asking? Did you design this vehicle before seeing the Ford GT. No, I can't pretend that. We'd say okay. the Ford GT. But, the but same you, race cars have yeah, been doing the yeah, same thing. Yeah, so, But yeah. like, as far as street cars go, that was really yeah, the yeah. first car to go, holy tunnels. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you yeah, know? Exactly, yeah. So it did set a little bit of the standard and the tone mm-hmm. there. Yeah, I think we've done it a different way. What you can see on our car is you can see the complete volume, as we would say, of the car, first of all. And then you see these Let tunnels a, being carved through it. I want to find a um, the full rear, the f- you know. Yeah. Um, that's that's the killer view, the rear view. Yeah, it's, you, the rear is like real, real crazy. You get everything there. You get the stance, a car with a lot of muscle, the cabin hunkered down between the wheels, and then you get the uh, the exit vents from the tunnels. Yeah, you can really see, see clear on through this. So, yeah. okay, so where... How much uh, downforce does this produce? Do we know yet? Yeah, we know, but we're not uh, we're not declaring yet. I mean, it must be a pretty absurd amount, right? It's. Um, I've worked on a lot of cars, and I know what the, what comes in with some racing cars, and it's it's seemingly quite shockingly mm. high. But we're being uh, reserved at the moment because we're only just starting to run real prototypes. So we've done a huge amount of CFD and analysis work generally but until we run real vehicles we yeah. want to be a bit uh, a bit cautious we don't want to over promise and under deliver but uh, i think we've got so much margin on the car i think it's going to be quite quite exciting the first company that actually does the drive upside down thing to demonstrate <laughs> that i'm telling you the first one to do it wins <laughs> been hearing that shit since i was yeah. a kid I, it's yeah. time are you volunteering <laughs> No, but like, <laughs> no, but you know what? Like Tanner would be all about that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Give Tanner like five G's. I'm like, yeah, I'll drive yeah, upside yeah. down. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be about that. No, this is like, so this is really exciting. You guys said you're going to make 130 of these. 130 of them. Yeah. And that's because the car's called the Type 130 internally. All Lotus cars have a type number. And uh, what uh, is, can I ask, happening in this window? Or is this a weird reflection that I'm just missing out? Is there an actual window in the bonnet in the front into something we're looking at? No, that's just that's a solid surface in terms of uh, the silver area. But at the back, again, it's uh, a gap between the trailing edge of the hood and the oh, underside. Oh, oh, okay. So it ducks the air through there. Um, it's, it's a smooth. wonky image, sorry. So it, it, it smooths the airflow over the cabin. So, yeah. Um, you can imagine as well, we had lots of uh, fun with referencing uh, fast jets and things when we were designing that. So you got the little wing formations mm. and things going on. In a company like Lotus, where it's such a commitment to analog cars for so mm. long, you know, long, long past most others have not only begun building mm. crossovers and shit, but like saying like mm. manuals, get out of here. You know what I mean? Mm. Like you guys are you guys are sticking with this one. Mm. And, you know, people like me just love that. So what happens when 
the CEO comes. All right, all right, here we go. We are we are doing a two thousand horsepower, thirty six hundred pound electric Piper car. Is the team happy? Is the team scratching their heads? Is the team going, well, this is the beginning of the end? Or, or you know, or, or is it going, well, at least he didn't ask us to do a two-liter crossover? You know what I mean? We were, no, we were really excited. I um, mean, it's, uh, as I say, you know, we do, we do sports cars as our day job, but a hypercar is sort of a once-in-a-lifetime job. And I think the opportunity of designing around an electric powertrain is really exciting. Uh, Design-wise, it frees us up in certain areas because you can place the battery and the motors in a That's more- That's a dual com- motor vehicle, right? Is that what we allowed to say? You're, you're getting beyond me technically All-wheel drive? It's all-wheel drive. Yeah, so, so we've, yeah, got, we've, got, four, we've got, four mo- we got four motors. You can drive the wheels in Oh, one on each wheel. Oh, yeah, so, so, we can, so we can torque vector, et cetera. Infinite but, torque vectoring. Hmm. That's some crazy shit. <laughs> Have you messed around with like the new NSX that has that? I haven't personally, but I'm sure our guys are. Uh, you like really that. should yeah, try and have yeah. a go because it the NSX particularly the GTR started it, you know, but it's mechanical. Mm. The NSX has the electric yeah, yeah. motors up front, and you know Porsche 918, of course, if you happen to have one of those around. But if you don't, I had to get rid of mine. The yeah. NSX is pretty mm. magic with the steering. Mm. It's pretty crazy, mm. you know, that to to simultaneously overdrive one wheel and underdrive mm. the other wheel mm. with infinite adjustment. That is some magic. It makes you feel like you are mm. Senna and you are not Senna. <laughs> well, you know our, our strap line is being for the drivers. Yeah. Well, although this is a completely different technology, mm. this is still very much for the drivers. And I think it's great to do uh, such a bold statement Halo product that no matter what we do in the future, there's no confusion. We are all about drivers' cars, performance cars, and we're a sports car brand at, at heart. So I think going back to your original question i think we were all really excited by the the opportunities design technology and a real opportunity to put us back on the top table you know of sports car manufacturers do something very very different and i'm sure um it's a bit bold of me to say this but you know mr chapman if he was still around would look at this because in his day he played around with four-wheel drive on formula one cars gas turbine turbo cars ground effect all those that's things that's true yeah he, he, he tried some weird stuff yeah um someone beautifully said lotus has always been powertrain agnostic you know it's not the the, the motor in the car has not been as significant as maybe with other sports cars. true so we yeah. so we're you got able, a camry motor in your best uh, car right now yeah. so mean, we're able to do different <laughs> things and we're not leaving uh, gasoline engine cars behind we're still you know we're still developing those as well well look at this nutty interior this is um, minimalist and yet also aggressive. Yeah. I just want, I mean, honestly, though, parallel parking with this wheel. What are we talking about? <laughs> can we, I, I, can we get a round wheel option? Can you guys please just in the north in this thing? I'm not going to own one. I don't care. Yeah. But I might own an Avora or the the follow up to the Avora. Yeah. Please just don't take away my round uh, steering wheel. It's just it's one well, of those the Avora where we have a flat on the bottom. Is that, that okay? It's okay, but just but just come on. Yeah, I once drove the Batmobile from the '60s. Yeah, the, the, the yeah, Lincoln yeah. with the bubble top. Yeah, the whole it's the top yeah. third of the steering wheel is gone. Yeah. You try and turn a corner, and there's just nothing there. <laughs> well, th- this wheel is appropriate for this sort of car, but sure. we would do something different for, uh, you know, a more conventional sports car, should we say. But uh, again, you know, the, we did all the development with this with Gavin, our uh, tame racing driver, and, uh, you know, uh, Guru, who's driven all the hyper cars. And, uh, you know, he was he was really keen on this push for this. So, uh, And the rest of the interior is really ergonomically intuitively laid out so uh, we had a big discussion about where we put screens so we've got one single screen latest generation tft 15 inch uh, tft in there um screens are really not, hard not 15 sorry but latest generation tft sorry yeah it's tough the the oem like grade for screens versus what you know people really expect from their phones mm. and stuff mm. like that i've i've learned so much about that recently mm. and there's a pretty big difference mm. between 
what a customer expects from their consumer screen mm. in terms of like responsiveness and mm. light and all that stuff mm. and like what you can put in something that's meant to last like 15 years mm. or whatever you know probably this much is, longer this is a really this. good resolution screen um and you can get all the obvious information through it so you've obviously got speed you've got range uh you can connect up your phone to it so you've got your navigation you've got your music your phone etc so and I've driven a, a, a pilot version on an Evora, and it's really. You, you know, guys even have it, an electric Evora around? Uh, no, we've got a, a car, a normal Evora that's got the electrical gear on. Oh, okay, so, cool. So we can navigate around it and check the menu systems work uh, well. Uh, so it's quite it's quite a simple menu system. So at 200 miles an hour plus, you're not uh, being distracted, basically. Yeah, EVs typically, are, is there is there a gearing situation there? Because uh, to EVs typically are not top speed type vehicles, or is it just with, with that many motors and that big of a battery, you can gear it low and it'll well, be- Well, we're just saying at the moment, it's, it's over 200 miles an hour. It's, for that much money, I yeah, hope so. Yeah, less, <laughs> less than three seconds to 60 and nine seconds, less than nine seconds to 186. So, Solid. So, uh, and as I say, that's probably conservative because we're, we're being cautious until we've got real cars running. Can we say how much this styling will influence what was implied to me is going to be like a whole bunch of cars the next few years? Mm -hmm. It's definitely going to influence them. I'm not going to say exactly what we're using um, because... Uh, that allows me opportunity to change my mind with the car. <laughs> good call. Yeah, good call. <laughs> Commit to nothing. <laughs> um, but we, we also need to adapt it appropriately to different types of cars. So obviously this car, we have freedom to run right with the sculpture and the aerodynamics. When we do other types of cars, we can't go quite as extreme. But I think the sort of, um, hopefully what you see, drama but elegance in the car, we will see in the other cars. The very strong uh, shoulder lines we talked about, mm. uh, that will definitely be in other cars because it's really important for us to be able to see the corners of the car when we're driving it. Um, and um, and we'll see where we go with th things like lights. I think the front lights, um, we've got some interesting stuff going on there and we're going to see how we can kind of progress and develop with those probably going forward. These but, front lights remind me a lot of Ferrari, uh, 488 has a similar type shape with this sort of slat in the middle of it? Well, the the long slim proportion really comes from the, the Elise, you know, which uh, had that very uh, sl slim proportion on it. But we've gone picture. something which is, uh, so the, the, the first of this series two Elises. Um, and we wanted to keep it compact. But inside what you've got in there, which is really different, is we've got uh, laser light units in there. Oh yeah, there's that light. I remember yeah. that light. Now you got to you got to you got to pull it up to see it. Yeah, the vertical, yeah. big vertical light. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you've got what else? Sorry, we've got laser light technology for main and dip beam, and then a bit of fun inside there. The daylight running light and the direction indicator. They're basically two blades, and they're shaped like uh, aircraft wing sections with the little upturned uh, tip on it. So, Ellie, uh, it must be fun to play with LEDs now that you can do. Yeah. Like you can actually kind of like animate your blinkers and stuff. And you've got that big bow tie formation in the back. Like, yeah, you must be able to they're do something like, really cool with that. Well, they look, uh, you know, like uh, afterburners when they're on basically. Like oh this. yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. Can you make them like glow different colors as you're like? There's only there's only one color on it, but see, they look pretty impressive when they're illuminated. Is it going to uh, make noises? Are you going to program? Are you gonna? You got to program noises, right? We're we're working on the noise side of it now. Uh, it's not something I've been involved with up until now, but yeah, that's obviously something we really got to think about. There's legislation to think about ex mm. external noise, but also making sure it feel it sounds cool when you're inside it. As I well. drove. Uh, have you driven an I Pace? Jaguar I Pace yet? No, we've got one on on site, but I've not driven it. Yeah, yet. you've got to have a go, yeah. and it's. I, I hope it's the fast one, the four hundred mm. or whatever. But when you drive it, um, it does like uh, Jetsons noises, like mm. like it. It actually makes it sound like the jet. It's pretty yeah, fun. Yeah. I, I, it's one of those things where you go, oh, that's going to be stupid. I don't want that. <laughs> and then you go, oh no, wait, that actually is yeah, pretty yeah. cool. Maybe I mean maybe you could be the first company to actually do the like F1 car soundtrack. You know what I mean? Just have it play Ayrton. Yeah. Like <laughs> I think we got a lot we've got a lot of opportunities to do yeah. something really exciting with that. So, yeah. Can you I don't know how much can you say anything at all about the the road cars and the, that situation? 
Like the new, the, the normal cars. The oh, new, the more normal, normal cars. Yeah, the normal cars. them, we're working on new cars. That's all I can say. That's obviously. it? Yeah. Oh, that's disappointing. I was hoping you would drop the drop like a truth bomb on us or something. No, I'm no? afraid not. No, they'd have, they'd have to kill me if I told you that. Well, but it's, it is good to have money though, right? It's, it's mean, yeah, definitely, yeah. We've, um, <clears throat> I think we've done a lot of really cool stuff in recent years, but we've been doing it, you know, really smartly because of tight budgets. And then suddenly we get access to uh, money which is not just about the money it gives you access to technology as well yeah and know-how we've got chance to you know um make a statement of intent uh, someone said it was you know like an explosion of creativity not just in the studio but engineering as well so that is really really exciting do you uh, have any desire like i mean you know, personally, we can separate your opinions from the company, or whatever. <laughs> like, you guys are both with Geely. Like, maybe like something with Volvo. Is there something like they? They're like, you know, really have real interesting designs, real interesting perspectives. Mm-hmm. Like, I think they're that two kind of quirky car companies mm-hmm. that are really representative of their cultures. You know, them with Sweden and you guys with England mm-hmm. could have a really interesting kind of crossover. Well, we haven't been specifically looking at that, no, but. Uh I think Volvo is a great inspiration to us in terms of what's achievable within the group. You yeah. Know, that they've kept their identity, but they've grown. They've done great products, design-led products. Um, so that's, you know, what Lotus is hoping uh, to achieve out of it all. That new um, XC90 I just saw was sweet. Mm. It was some, like, silly kind of edition, like Ocean Race edition or something. Like, it was a kind yeah, of... Yeah. but Is that it? I think it might be Ocean Race edition. Whatever yeah. it was, it looked amazing. Mm. It was beautiful. No, they're great cars. I, I, I drive as the everyday car. I drive a, an XC60, and that's a great car. Oh, you do? Yeah. Yeah, those are cool. Yeah. What about in, in your in your past? What I mean, have you just have you just rotated your way through every Lotus demo that there ever was, or do you do you have some some non Lotus vehicles in the car stable? There's a fair bit of Lotus. Yeah, I had uh, I had Elise's f- as everyday cars for about 13 years. I've got a an Exige at the moment. I've got a Navora that uh, I bought a couple, two or three years ago, one of the original series. And then I've got a Jaguar E-Type as well. Oh, that's well, nice. XKE, that's very nice. XKE in your money, isn't it? Yeah. No, it could be both. Yeah. I, th- I don't know what year or what desi- at what time it switched from mm. E-Type to XKE. Maybe mm. when they went with a 12? Okay. Yeah, Maybe mine's, mine's a '66 4.2. Those so. are great. What yeah. color? It's yellow premium. Oh, I yellow. just saw a yellow today. Really? This morning with the yeah. wire wheels heading down to Playa del Rey. Oh, okay. Two guys looking like they really en- were enjoying themselves. <laughs> Those are they're fun, man. Yeah. So it's the car that I first remember noticing design on. So mm. when I was about I don't know three years old or something, there was in our local village. There was, I, th- I guess it was a doctor had a red E type. Yeah. And I can spe- specifically remember seeing the car from the rear view and those two exhaust pipes giving the uh, <laughs> gesture. Yeah, yes. Gesture. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. just thinking this is something something very, uh, very special. Yeah. Um, so that kind of sparked my imagination with cars. And then pretty quickly, uh, Lotus came on the scene. You know, I had the little Formula One cars and I had the Rogue, the Lotus Europa yeah. toy car. I think uh, a lot of my generation of car designers, it was it was the Matchbox or Hot Wheels cars that, you know, got... I have those too in yeah, there. You can yeah, see them. Yeah. And I had, the, I had the posters and now I got the real car too, which yeah. is real nice when you get the car off the poster. Yeah. <sighs> That's the jam. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, um, the E-Type is like... It's such a design icon. It's not. Mm. It's not remotely surprising. And Ian Callum had a vintage Jag as well. He had that really yeah. cool Mark One. Yeah. Designers like yeah. old Jags. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, he kind of had to, didn't he, working at Jaguar? But I think yeah, no, I there think are, he did anyway. There are a lot of designers around the world who have E types. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's it's just a it's a very beautiful looking car. You know what Ian told me once that mm. he had never owned a single car he designed. 
Is that right? Isn't that is that he and and at first I thought that is so strange because wouldn't you want the Im- physical embodiment of your work? Mm-hmm. It must be so satisfying. And he actually said no because by the time it gets to be production, it's not really my design anymore. Mm-hmm. It's been jiggered for you know uh, production and mm-hmm. whatnot. He said if I could have a drivable version of the concept that we made, mm-hmm. like yeah, but it's yeah, not yeah. the same. So do you think that way too, or is it satisfying I, for you? Um, I guess sometimes the the frustration is uh, yeah there, there's always something on a car that uh, you would do, do differently if you had another go at it yeah so I think that sometimes probably as well does something uh, come to mind uh, no it's true I mean if you were totally satisfied with what you did well you'd have to give up wouldn't you because yeah. the nature of being a designer is you've got to be restless you've got to want to push it to the next level each time you know maybe that time when you think I'm done now. I can't do anything better. That's 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 the time you have to go and tend to the, tend to the roses mm. or whatever it is in the garden. Uh, so, uh, but so uh, clipping. Uh, the kids. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I have I have I have two lotuses at home that that I've worked on. So um, I just sometimes have to make sure I approach them from one angle where I can't see the thing which I want oh, to change. No, oh, yeah. I want to change, you know, so. Well, you, you can modify your uh, own car. <laughs> Have you modified your own cars later in a way that satisfies you more visually or? Mm, no, I, have, I haven't done that. No, I haven't done that. <clears> do you modify your cars at all ever really or do you just leave them? No, they're, they're all they're all stock really. I mean, I guess, you know, if you, if I got to know the engineers and the people mm. designing them the way you did, I'd probably go, you know what, they, they got this right mm. and, that would, and they'd leave it alone, I bet. Mm. I yeah, think mate. the more you learn about why something was done the way it was, mm-hmm. the more you know about it, the more you understand why mm-hmm. you probably shouldn't mess <laughs> with it too much. <laughs> um, what was, oh, I, what I just want to ask you about, is it nice to work at a place that you, where you've never had to design like a boring sedan too much or, or where you can really stick to sports cars? I, I met the guy who designed the new Toyota Supra mm-hmm. at the launch. Yeah. And he worked at whatever Toyota's like des- design division is. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's called something. I can't remember what mm-hmm. it is. But he had literally never done a sports car mm-hmm. before. He was like fucking giddy that he got to yeah. do a sports car, any sports car. But when you only do sports cars, does the shine wear off? No, not at all. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's good all the time. I think um, uh, we quickly learn certain rules that we want to want to apply by doing it time and time again but as i say there's there's always challenges you know there's changes in fashion there's changes in technology performance uh, maybe the platforms change so there's always something new to do and um, we haven't just done sports cars because until uh, a few years ago we were very active doing consultancy work for other people so we uh, we did um we did uh, saloon cars and SUVs. And well, I remember cars. I ah. went to New Zealand and ah. there was a vehicle called an Isuzu Bighorn. Right. Which here in America, I think, was sold as the Trooper. Yeah. And it had a handling by Lotus yeah. badge. On yeah. It. <laughs> we didn't do any design work on it, but no, the guys did a lot of dynamics work on that <laughs> and around the world. On it the very was same. one of the funniest uh, things. Uh, I mean, you know, you got to do what you got to do, man. Mm. And some of those cars were really cool, like the Suzu Impulse yeah. and stuff like that were really neat. Mm. But to see this like body on frame truck with the handling <laughs> by Lotus badge was pretty funny. It's like, yeah, we used to see all that sort of stuff going around the test track the guys yeah. working and developing on it yeah so so yeah no from a studio perspective yeah we've worked on all kinds of things we've worked on motorcycles and scooters and all kinds of things as well at a small company like lotus do you get track time in your personal cars can you just go have a little little go uh there's a motor club that do various things i'm on we're too busy working on designing the cars to be honest um in the early days i used to go out on the track uh quite a lot just evaluating the cars i tend to drive more on the road now just because i can instantly uh, reference how the car feels because i don't spend a lot of time on the track the first Do you have you have a little route you like yeah, to drive yeah, and you go here's yeah, the bump yeah, where i yeah, check exactly. this yeah whereas if if i go out on the test track the first few laps i'm just worrying about being on the test track so i'm not really learning anything at all and i'm always you're always looking over your shoulder because there's there's a proper driver who's going to be coming up quickly uh i even remember that in the early days when i joined school, i've been there 29 years and um 
And when you're out on the track, there would be guys doing the development work on the Corvettes with the LT5 engines in. There would be the Alans oh, yeah. out there. Lotus would did work uh, on those too, uh, huh? And also the we did the car called the Lotus Cult and all Lotus Omega, which was a GM car. Those are the coolest. Mm, yeah, there are literally two in Los Angeles. Is that right? Because they're not. Yeah, because they just became legal. They're mega rare. One is that guy brought of the, one in the year rule. Is the it? year, so it's twenty five years old is here is the law for America. Yeah. And then California is has its own laws on top of that. Yeah. So but there's a guy who's got a Carlton and I've seen him in the canyons like caning it. It go, it goes. Like, and he's and he's like modified it a little bit and it makes really cool turbo noises yeah, yeah. too. Same guy brought in a Sierra yeah. Cosworth. He's yeah. a boss. If you're listening, <laughs> call me back, dude. <laughs> but you can imagine if you're out there as a timid designer who doesn't normally go on the track and you've got proper drivers and of course some of the drivers we used to have a guy uh, john miles who did a lot of work for us ex formula one driver ex teammate with Joachim rent so they're quite good the guys they do <laughs> you, know what they're if you doing survived I, f1 in the uh, 70s uh, yeah. yeah you just get you just get the points for that yeah that's that that was a that lifestyle that formula one in the 70s fuck out of here <laughs> that's a crazy it was. I, I just saw that new documentary with uh, Enzo Ferrari recently. There was um, like race, not like it's called like race to the afterlife or ra- race to immortality. I think it's called Ferrari mm. race to immortality. And the whole film was basically just about how Enzo Ferrari didn't care if his drivers died. <laughs> that was like pretty much yeah. the whole dull gist of the entire thing. Um so, I mean, even in a company like Lotus, you know, you obviously have, uh, even if not restrictions on your uh, pencils to paper, you know, to design sports mm. cars, there's budget restrictions, must exist in the real world restrictions, EU regulations and not. Like, how how uh, how much of that is, like, kind of built into your head and your thought process when you're designing and how much of it is like total freedom and then let me now rework this so it could actually be something reasonably usable yeah we've got a certain amount built into our knowledge you know we know you know federal cars for example there's certain bumper heights the 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 lamps have to be at certain heights and things like that Um, sometimes the specific millimeter um, accuracy goes out of your mind um, but you kind of know it's there and you do a check with the studio engineers or the uh, or the legal guys etc but it but it's there and, and you know you've got to work with it um, sometimes you just if you think that's going to be a real obstacle you you just really focus on something and figure how can we get around this is there a different way of looking at it a different mm-hmm. way of interpreting it but it's it's yeah it's part of the uh, the nature of it. We, you always look at what other people do. Um, you can learn quite a lot. There are other sports car manufacturers who manage to get you know seemingly the bumper height much lower uh, than perhaps you would think you could do it with uh, legislation. Cornet. And then, <clears throat> and then <laughs> but actually, it is possible to do it technically. You know, you just you have to be clever with where you put the, the structural foams below the surface. Um, it's where you call where the there's there's different beam heights they test things at and uh, and you can be smart with that as well. So um, sometimes it's how much you apply yourself to to do things differently. But um, they're all the obvious ones. You've got to you, you always start with um, pretty early on. There's a package as we refer to it. So that lays out. The occupant yeah. in different guises, from the smallest, smallest woman, not uh-huh. being sexist, but they, that's how it works. Is you know, it's percentiles a, it's or whatever, percentiles, right? Yeah. yeah, right through to the tallest, uh, tallest person in there. You've obviously got a basic layout. Layout starts with, with what kind of motor you're putting in there and volumes for luggage, etc. Wheel sizes, and of course, as designers, we always push the diameter of the wheel <laughs> as big as possible. Yeah. Um, and you then play with proportions. You know where do, where does the occupant sit? Do you want the car to be cab forward, cab rearward? Do you want short front overhang, um, or maybe you want a longer front overhang with a short rear one to give the car a little bit of imbalance to give the car a dynamic when it's uh, standing still? Do you um, do you think now? I know there's not there's only so many companies. There's only so many designers. It's a tough job to get a mm-hmm. job like yours, yeah. even one. 
at a couple levels below where you are is still a very tough job to yeah. get. A lot of people would love mentally in their head to have a job like mm-hmm. that. They don't really necessarily know the realities mm-hmm. of it, but that seems awesome. Mm-hmm. And look, here's the first question for the Super Chat. By the way, if you want to ask Russell Carr some questions and you're live with us right now, get in the Super Chat. We're going to do that for a few minutes before because he's got more interviews, I think, after this. <laughs> where do you have to go after this? Yeah, we got something else on this evening. So we have Rob, a, we've where do you busy- have to go? I don't know. Where do you have to go? Where, what part of LA after this? Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Makes us sound so glamorous, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, just in the car all day. Um, no, but so your your job is like a dream job. Yeah. Or like my job, right? Yeah. So it, when you first were inspired by the Jag and decided that you mm. wanted to, to design cars, did you have any artistic talent? I I started drawing cars at a really early age. I was very, I was very lucky. My my dad did lots of interesting jobs, and one of the interesting jobs he did was he worked for Mercedes Benz for a while. And they had a house magazine um, that came out. I don't know if it was every month or every quarter. And in the back there was a bit where kids could do drawings of cars. I remember the learn to draw. Yeah, yeah, learn yeah. To draw. so I started off drawing standard road cars, and um, this will date me at that particular era they had a concept car called the C111, and that oh, kind of yes, got me very Mercedes, excited. Mercedes, yeah. So that got me very excited. So I then thought, well, what about if, you know, there could be other Mercedes that look like this? Maybe I can design something. So I started drawing my own design. So that was the, that was the sort of start process. And then, um, and then I just became obsessed with drawing all the time. So... Uh, that's my excuse for not. Do you draw? Did you ever draw anything else? Do you draw other stuff? Reluctantly. Yeah, <laughs> like in school <laughs> and whatever. But. Yeah, and they'd make you draw a bowl of fruit or you know, right, or some flowers or something. And usually, I would then draw the bowl of fruit with maybe a car in the background. <laughs> Um, <laughs> this is called Grapes, Banana, and Lamborghini Girama. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Banana and Girama, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, you know, there's people that kind of I talk to who, who write about cars like I do, and, you know, they were like writers first. You know, yeah. maybe they were a, a professor or wrote about something else that had nothing mm-hmm. to do with car. You know, so it, I just, when designers come in here, I'm curious as to, you know, if they if they learned all of their talent and they just had a vision and then went to the right school and applied themselves Mm -hmm. or if they had a natural ability or like you did, I guess an obsession with drawing cars. Yeah. I had an obsession with drawing cars and, uh, I kind of hoped it would be my career when I was at school. And then when you get to that point where, um, they start uh, saying, what would you like to do? And I said, I'd like to be a car designer. And they said, well, I don't think that's a real job really. It's, there's engineers, but you know, yeah, you're not you could design parts, yeah, but well, they were more cruel than that. They were, I don't think you're really clever enough to be an engineer. <laughs> uh, you know, why don't you look at something different? So um, I went to an art college then, which did all kinds of different things. You know, it did graphic design and, and interior design. I thought, well, this is pretty cool as well. I'm, I'm enjoying this. It's not cars. But then I suddenly found a prospectus for Coventry University, or it was called the Lanchester Polytechnic then. And suddenly it was all the things I thought car design was. Mm. And then you go to a place that like that, and it's partly to do with the tuition, it's partly to do with the people who are around you because you've got a load of other guys who are hungry to be car designers and you push one another. You know, every presentation you do at college, someone does a bit more they do it a bit better so that the next time you push yourself and um so you sort of teach yourself as well and then they bring in designers from local industry um to, to sort of guide you it sounds so like art center so it, yeah Same kind of so thing. yeah and it, it just builds on itself really but is it, a lot, end, is it a lot harder than you expected it to be though i guess it is hard work but it's uh, because it's your passion you don't you don't see it really yeah um I guess, and I, I guess I've been very lucky as well. You know, um, um, I've not, I've not been out of work, and I've been offered jobs at the time, which were were very exciting to me. You know, uh, great potential, but uh, 
but equally I did put I have put a lot of hours in both then and now yeah. I mean the, the guys here would, would would back me up we work a lot of hours in the studio to do what we do I'm uh, sure an obsession so uh, cool Glenn says as an Avora 400 owner I want to say I am very pleased with it uh, is there any truth to the rumor that Lotus service may be available at Volvo dealers in a few years due to the Geely investments in both companies I've not heard that myself, but I don't sit on that side of the business. You know, um, I, I hear a lot of what goes on in the business, but uh, we we close our door. And it wouldn't be the worst thing. In. We uh, we get uh, our clay models and our pens out, and uh, we work hard on doing things like the Avaya. But um, not that I've heard of, but it, it's not to say that that isn't a possibility either. Mm. So that's not a very good answer. I'm sorry about that. It would be nice if you guys could get up with Volvo's like financing division. Mm. That would be nice. Mm. A Lotus Bank would be helpful. Um. Yeah, no, I'm sure. I mean, I, I've heard that from other people as well. That yeah. there, there are other brands where maybe the cars are more. LA is such a lease yeah. culture. Yeah, exactly. You know, even in the UK, it is now. Yeah. So yeah. makes it hard to compete with 911s, mm. which you can lease. Mm. You know, and Boxsters and stuff, which yeah. you can lease around here. Uh, Jorge, uh, sorry, Jorge, I love you. I we're gonna we're gonna stick with. Uh, I'm gonna stick with uh, questions only related to uh, Lotus for the rest of the show <laughs> because your time is valuable mm. and you have to get to Beverly Hills. Uh, Matt. Uh, Shakar says, Matt, can you make a case to Mr. Carr for an Avora with the LC500 V8? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Has anyone suggested shoving an LC500 V8 in the back of an Avora? Because that would be fucking tasty. Uh, there are always lots of discussions about lots of different, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great powertrains? Yeah. Uh, but it takes, as you know, it takes a, a huge amount of development work and homologation every time you change change a motor. Let's um, get the at least and the exige in America first. Uh, Can we uh, work on that? And then, um, and then and we think we've got, you know, uh, the the uh, current engine we've got is a pretty tasty motor, isn't it? 410 horsepower. Oh, yeah. No, that motor rips. Uh, um, Most people are like, this is a Camry motor? <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> what do I need to know about Camrys right now? Yeah. <laughs> it's a seriously quick car. So, yeah. Um, yeah, try try one of those first. And people are doing Evora superchargers on Toyota and Lexuses mm. as well. All is that over. right? Okay. Yeah, I've seen a couple of them. Okay. Yeah, I re do recommend. They're, they're, they're real Q cars, those, aren't they? Okay. Yeah, like a GS350 Lexus with the supercharger. That's hot right yeah. there. That's a super sleeper. Nice and mm. quiet, good fuel economy. Um, I would love to see an LC500 in the back. of. I don't know if that gearbox would hold yeah. up. It might be a challenge. Plus, transverse with that? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And but, I think, you know, they they're also reality sometimes uh, in terms of the commercial aspects. Yeah, yeah. It's what people are willing to, to sell you. There's what's the real world cost of it. All yeah. those all those sort of things as well. So, yeah, we all, uh, over the years, we've all dreamt big about wouldn't it be cool if. Well, there's room in between uh, the Avora uh, and uh, the Avaya. Hmm. So let's uh, spree this thing up with yeah. a little LC500 V8 yeah. action. You're, you're the guy. <laughs> Bring it back. <laughs> Uh, Sean says, what do you think about the Toyota MR2 from a design perspective? I find it interesting that all three generations are so different, but reflect their time period. Yeah, cool cars. I had uh, I had two of the first generation ones. Um, and I think there was a pretty close link with Lotus at the time because we were part owned by Toyota at that particular time. Um, and there's definitely a lot of similarities in theme with the Esprit of that time, you know, very wedge-shaped car, yeah. and even the dashboard, you know, the uh, the angled surface, etc. So that was a that was a good fun car. But yeah, all the uh, all the MRCs were really really cool cars, actually. Second um, gen ones are my favorite. Yeah. Those are nice. The people are doing some real cool Japanese motor swaps into those things, and they mm. go real fast. I think the second one, yeah, it's got a very sort of classic sort of Ferrari esque design to it isn't it which is uh, yeah very attractive i remember at the time it was kind of like uh mondial-esque almost right mm. it had sort of the same kind of yeah. feel about it nice they were very they're very good super cars uh 81 wants to know who makes lotus's dampers these days uh good question we use i think we use more than one supplier we use bill stein as one of them uh, certainly so i'm not sure who else we use then they're good the ones mm. in the Avora GT mm. are really nice. Uh, Kadori Crunch says, how do you feel about redesign kits such as the S14 Boss Kit? Do you know what that is? No. So the, the, these are kits where you 
it basically takes a car and kind of makes it look like another car. So here's a, an example of a more common one. This is the, the boss kit. So this is a Nissan 240SX, but with this front end that makes it look almost like a Cuda and then a wide body kit on it. So it kind of transforms it into so, t sort of like a, a different car. <laughs> You're making a well, yeah. you're making let's you're making a good well, face. Just make that face again. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a little bit of Alpha GTA from that. View. Little uh, yeah, a little bit of GTV, yeah, GTA, uh, GTV, yeah. But I, it's like anything, it's how well it's done really. If it becomes just a kind of pastiche uh, a joke, then then that's not so good. If it ends up looking something really cool at the end, well, yeah, why, why not? It's kind of popular it's not in great the drift for us. community. It's not great for us guys, obviously, if someone does it and they do it better. The uh, car's like 25 <laughs> years old, don't worry about it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, you see, you see those things all, all over the world, don't you? Uh, Do you have a general opinion when you see, like, you know, even some of those really high, quote, high end, like body kits and stuff like mm -hmm. that? I think Lotus has been pretty spared, actually, yeah. for most of that stuff, haven't they? Yeah, you get a lot with things like Range Rovers and things like uh, that, don't yeah. you? Where people want to take them to the next yeah level. Well, um, here in LA, you know, Lamborghini. I mean, yeah. everybody's got a body kit on a Huracan around here. Yeah. Some um, of the stuff is is obviously more alien to Lotus because Lotus historically has been much more about sort of purity and simplicity. And yeah. by nature, a lot of those tend to push it more towards an ostentatious end of the, of the market. <laughs> but then, you yeah. know, as I said before, it's it's not a rational decision buying these cars, which means by nature... Um, there's a million and one personal tastes that go into this. So uh, who am I to judge somebody else, you know, if they want, you know, gold chrome wheels on, on their car? Never whatever, seen them on, uh, on a lease uh, before. No, <laughs> Someone's um, got to get the Ronald teddy bears onto, uh, <laughs> onto a lease. I'd forgotten about those. Yeah, those you know how much money a set of those is worth? No. They are worth big dollars. Is that right? Yeah, you get those on a GTI, you win Waterfest. It's like, pfft, game over. <laughs> No, the only Lotuses I ever see modified are at a racetrack and turned into race cars. Yeah. They're not, they're nobody's. There are one or two around. I've seen ones where they've actually, um, the good thing is usually they've upped the diameter of the the wheel. Um, I, I hate to think what tire they found because uh, we have those discussions at work and there's never a tire that's suitable <laughs> yeah. dynamically. So they probably picked some obscure, you know, uh, compound and tread, but... I've seen it. I've seen a few which are a little bit that way, but yeah, you're right. Mostly the modifications are making them more track focused with our cars. Um, let's see. W. Bush, love you, but uh, we're gonna pass. Uh, Sozen ninety one says, "Where does the license plate go on the Avaya?" Okay, so front and rear we have provision Wait, for license plates. Do I still have a picture? Uh, so on the front, uh, uh, yeah. So on the front, on the lower splitter, there's a. There's a bracket that will go that on there. It goes down right down yeah, here. Which you'll hold on. I don't know. Uh, and yeah, okay, in between the silver. It's in the middle. Yeah, the front and the middle, yeah. The same as on uh, sort of on our current cars, on a lot of other ones as well. Uh -huh. And then at the rear, we've actually got a, uh, a specific plug-in one that goes just above Let me the, get you the vertical picture. red light. So, so there's a vertical... Uh, uh, red, sorry. red stop light in the center. Oh, Vertical red yeah, stop light. Yeah, oh, right there. Light. Okay, so it's yeah. the the stop light is right uh, yeah. at the very top of the center fin of the the rear yeah. diffuser. So there. just just where that well, it's not actually a stop light. I used the wrong term there, but so where that touches the top of the diffuser, mm -hmm. there's a, a panel which you can plug in the license plate holder. And the the reason we did it that way was because for those people who want to take that car on track, um, they can. They can disconnect it and they can maximize the efficiency of the diffuser um, because they can use right to the top. top it zones. probably significantly stalls out the diffuser with exactly, a plate there, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. I bet you it's a significant difference. We can see in here this this uh, horizontal element. This is the lower yeah. center element of that's the a, That's a DRS flap. So that oh, cool. moves according to whether or not you want you know downforce or you want low drag. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Is there and the? I imagine this. It appears that there's an upper sort of hydraulic or electric wing section yeah, as well, exactly, right? Exactly. Yeah. So that that deploys and then the pitch of the wing adjusts according to speed as well. That's so. pretty rad. Also, air brakes. Air brakes are cool. Uh, 
Eric Slaughter would like a job. He lives in Toronto, but he'll wash the toilets. Anything? <laughs> Anything. We do need someone for that. They do. Send it in, dude. <laughs> they need a janitor. Get over there. It's a ground floor. Dante Zero wants to know, do you admire or are you inspired by any motorcycles? Are you a motorcycle guy? I don't ride myself, but I grew up around uh, in, in the family motorcycles being around. And yes, I am inspired by it. Uh, particularly, I think, the way they treat all the... The detailing on bikes, uh, fantastic. Um, the Husqvarna, we, we've looked at a lot recently. Fantastic color and material, paint finishes. The way they treat all the metal components, the sort of anodized finishes is, is really superb. And there's that sense with the motorcycle. It's um, designed around the essential elements, but make sure that the essential elements are good looking. So, not sadly, not on sale in this country, but um, two of our products sort of follow a bit of that philosophy are the Elise and the Exige. So, you obviously get the chassis exposed, which is a bit like a motorcycle where you see the frame. Yeah. And then we expose the gear linkage on those ones. Uh, That's the coolest. I love uh, those the shifters where you can yeah, see the yeah, linkage. Yeah. Spiker did it back in yeah. 08 or 07, whenever yeah, they came exactly, out. Yeah. I miss those cars so much. They were the coolest. <laughs> it just reminds you of motorsport, and it's very efficient weight-wise, and people like that stuff. It's even, you know... With watches, people like glass backs on them, mm -hmm. so you can see the mechanical. Display so, back, definitely. So yeah, definitely motorcycles. Uh, you know, inspire us. Uh, they again are generally not rational purchases. People don't use them anymore for commuting to and from work. They do it because they're exhilarating to ride, exhilarating to look at, display. You know, beautiful engineering. So there's a lot of inspiration there. Uh, cool. Uh, Trent wants to know, were you inspired at all for the Avaya by the LaFerrari? There are a few similarities, although at that performance level, the computers will dictate a lot of the same requirements, which end you in sort of a lot of the same places, yeah. right? We, we obviously look, looked at all the current and recent uh, hypercars, so you know, LaFerrari's in there. And that is a, I mean, that is a great-looking car. So. It is. It's very pretty. So... Um, our car's actually quite a lot more compact. We're, we're a little bit taller because we've gone for adjustable seats in the car rather than adjusting the pedals, which was a Lotus uh, sort of philosophical thing that we think it's more weight efficient to move the seat um, because you have to put more structure in to support the, the column and the pedal box if you're gonna adjust those. So we're a little bit a little bit taller, not very much, um, but we are quite a lot shorter than a, a LaFerrari, and that's partly the powertrain. But that's a very Lotus thing then because the car's going to be more agile, shorter wheelbase, and also uh, saves weight as well, obviously not being so big. Neat. Uh, two more, and they're quick ones, and then we're going to get out of here. Uh, Brazen Rain says, is an Evora a good upgrade from a Subaru BRZ for involvement? I'll just give you a yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Evora is a logical step up from almost anything. Yes, no, it's, definitely. It's a great car, and I and I'm not just saying that because I work for the company. No, it they is, rule. It I is. say that over and over. Yeah. It's like if you like the old NSX and you wish Acura made that, Lotus still makes that. It's mm -hmm. called an Evora GT, mm -hmm. and you could buy it mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. now. It's a brand new old NSX with a warranty <laughs> and 400 horsepower. It's awesome. 410. 410, sorry. Excuse me. Uh, last, last one. Night Shift says, other than Avaya, what is your favorite Lotus design-wise? Uh, the ones I worked on, uh, obviously Avaya, because it's the latest baby. The first uh, of the Elises I worked on was really special, and it's great, great that that car is still selling well. And we recently picked up a Icon of Icons award for that car from British Magazine Auto Car, so that's pretty gratifying. Where is my beautiful picture of it? Yeah, the S1. I've actually never driven uh, no, it. The uh, the S2 is the oh, one the I S2 could, is the one you worked on. Yeah, sorry. sorry, the one yeah. on the left. Yeah. So you know that's pretty pretty special. But of the ones I didn't work on, I think uh, we all love the Esprit. Um, well, I worked on the later ones, but you know the early ones are, are great cars. The first proper road car, the Elite, is an achingly beautiful car of its era and was a great racing car as well. So uh, they're also favorites of mine. Cool. I like those as well. Did you ever, before you get out here, you ever drive a DeLorean? 
I've never driven a DeLorean. I sat inside one. We had one at the factory when I first joined there. So, uh, I owned one, and it's, uh, you know, they have the same kind of Y-frame chassis, mm-hmm. and a lot of stuff is in a spree. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting driving experience. These sprees are better, <laughs> quite a lot better. Yeah. But um, Lack it, the drama of the doors. The doors go a really long way. They do. I mean, they when the doors go up, you know the rest, the second half of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything other than, um, you know, general Lotusness and Avaya and uh, Lotus Cars USA, anything else you want to promote before we get out of here? No, I just, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd urge all the people you've mentioned, Evora, to t- take a look at the latest one, basically. You know, it's a, go it's test a, drive an Evora. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find Evora out where GT your dealer is, is and go drive really one. Good one. They rule. Every, every time I drive one, like, it is just like the nicest mm-hmm. thing it's you just go holy shit this is a really nice mm. thing it's so mm. useful and like easy and great but uh, very yeah, fun just get out on a lotus they're great to drive whether or not it's one of the brand new ones or a secondhand uh, elise or an avora actually can i give a shout out to the automatic gearbox which Rob let me drive a couple months ago, mm-hmm. and it was vastly better than I expected it to be. Good. I expected it to really, really suck, and it didn't at all. It mm-hmm. was actually shockingly good. Mm-hmm. Like, at least as good response-wise as, like, those ZFs they put in everything. Like, mm-hmm. at least that good. And uh, and it really it really doesn't uh, take away from the, uh, the, the lotusness mm-hmm. of the car. It was great. Good, good job, sir. Good. Not my area of game, but uh, as you like it, I'll take the praise. No, it's well. It looks good too. How about that? It looks good too. I feel I feel cool when I drive it, which is something yeah. that is important in a sports car. You got to feel cool when you drive it. Yeah, and it's, as I said earlier, the good thing is that you feel cool and you get a good reaction from people. People recognize that you're a a car guy that you've not bought it to. to show you know what's off. good about Lotuses? Yeah, they they actually have z- almost zero pretense. Mm. You could paint one nuclear waste green, and in fact, you have, uh. and and people are still like, "Oh, that's awesome! That's cool!" Yeah, yeah there's they're they're not pretentious at all. Yeah. People dig them. Yeah, Russell Carr, head of design. Thank you Thank very you. much, sir. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And I look forward to. Can I? Am I going to fit in the? Of course, <laughs> I will. Can I drive one when there's a drivable one, please? Definitely. I yeah. love. I I'm excited to see what 2,000 horsepower <laughs> feels like. That's crazy. It's gonna feel good. Thank you all for listening. If you're in LA and you need a place to keep your collector vehicle, Westside Collector Car Storage, my new venture has you covered. Hit me up at westsidecollectorcarstorage.com. And lastly, before we get out of here, the Smoking Tire Podcast is powered by Shout Engine. Get your own damn podcast at shoutengine.com. It's easy. All you need is a microphone, a connection to the internet, and ideally something to say. I don't know what else we're doing this week. I'm going to find someone else to podcast with, and we're going to do another show later in the week. And when we do, we're going to drink the English, this lovely uh, uh, scotch from, or whiskey, excuse me, from Hethel. From Norfolk, thank, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. You're Thanks, welcome. Rob. I'm, I'm sorry about uh, your traffic. This is going to be terrible for you. <laughs> 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 Good night. <laughs>